Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Career in Finance alumni webinar series. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that Laurier's campuses are located on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. My name is Barry McCormick, and I'm the Corporate Engagement Officer for the Lazaridi School of Business and Economics, and I'm a BBA alumnus from 2011. I want to congratulate our audience today uh, for getting into the Lazaridi School. By accepting your offer, you've joined a community that includes an alumni network of more than 30,000 engaged graduates working in 86 countries around the world. 2,000 of those grads are founders of their own businesses, and 600 hold the position of president or CEO. Today, we're going to be joined by a couple members of that community for a unique opportunity to hear about their experiences at the Lazaridi School and their careers since graduating. Uh, you'll be able to ask the panelists questions during the webinar uh, through the box on the screen. We'll be reserving questions today uh, about our speaker's career and time at Laureate. I'd like to introduce our, uh, our first panelist, uh, Ed Devlin, a uh, BBA graduate from 1988. Ed is a Managing Director and Head of Canadian Portfolio Management at PIMCO. Ed, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, tell the students a little about yourself. Ed, I think you're uh, muted there. There you hey, go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfectly. Oh, I apologize for that. Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I, I think I am the uh, the the senior person on the the webinar here today. Um, so uh, yeah, I graduated in '88. Um, loved my time at Laurier. Um, and, uh, you know, after Laurier, I, I worked in management consulting for a number of years, um, didn't like that as much as I wanted to, and then went off to graduate school in the U.S., where I joined um, the investment banking community, uh, originally with Goldman Sachs and then Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers. I um, had a fun career kind of around the world, uh, in Asia and Europe, as well as the U.S., and for the last 15 years almost, uh, I've been uh, working at a, a, an investment firm called PIMCO, uh, which is one of the largest uh, bond investing um, places in the world. We I manage almost $2 trillion uh, in assets, and I run um, the, all the Canadian assets as well as some U.S. assets. And uh, I'm actually just ending my career at PIMCO shortly and probably moving on to a bit more of... Uh, a new career in private equity and some of the things that will be uh, uh, kind of my own shop. So that's that's my quick background. Thanks, Ed. Uh, our second panelist is a BBA 96 graduate and CFO at Gallagher Global Brokerage Services, uh, Faye Ann Beattie. Faye Ann, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a little about yourself and your career? Sure, thanks, Graham. Yeah, so uh, Faye Ann Beattie, uh, graduate from 96. I've uh, been um, in, I left uh, when I left Laurier. I actually uh, went through and did my CPA or CA exam then, CPA now. Um, so I did some articling at uh, BDO Dunwoody as well as uh, Arthur Anderson, and then decided I'd like to actually see how things uh, come, projects actually come to full fruition. So I left uh, public practice and went into private industry. Uh, I spent about 22 years in the insurance industry. I've worked uh, on the insurance company side with uh, Royal Ensign Alliance, or RSA, as well as uh, Genworth Financial, which is a mortgage insurance company. Uh, and then I transferred about six years ago onto the brokerage side of the business, and I've spent, uh, I spent three and a half years at Aon as their CFO and COO, and then I uh, have most recently I'm at to, as a CFO for Gallagher Canada, which is uh, the third largest national property and casualty insurance brokerage in Canada. And we have about 1,100 employees coast to coast. So a little bit about myself. Thanks, that was great. Uh, our third panelist is Guavier uh, Cahill, a BBA graduate from 2011 and Associate Director, Real Estate Investment Management at Timber Creek. It's great to have you. Uh, tell us a little about yourself. Thanks, Graham. Um, after Laurier, I joined CIBC to do Canadian equity research on the buy side team, um, investing billions of dollars. After two years, I actually went back to do, do grad school um, in the UK. 
I enjoyed my time there and then came back to Canada to join uh, CI Investments doing global equity research for the last five years. Um, earlier this year, um, I made a transition where I went from public equities to private equity um, and had moved into the real estate area. So I joined Timber Creek a couple of months ago. Um, we invest in multi-residential commercial properties across North America, um, and I work on the team that does those investments. That was great. Thanks, Guavier. Uh, joining us today from Turtle Creek Asset Management is Mike Sestis. Mike is a senior investment analyst and a graduate from 2013. Mike, tell us a little about yourself. Thanks, Graham. Um, well, my background is pretty simple. I was in the co-op program at Laurier, and so I had three co-op terms to try out different things. So I spent them all at the same firm called Gluskin Chef which is an investment firm in Toronto. And then I think they got used to me after being there for three terms. So they gave me a full-time offer, which I accepted. And so I joined Gluskin as an analyst uh, in 2013 when I graduated. I stayed for two years and then I moved to Turtle Creek, which is where I am now. So I guess I've been here for almost five years. And so I'm an analyst today, but I guess now I'm a senior analyst. So things are, things are going well and I really like it. Thanks, Mike. Uh, our final panelist is Claire Fleming. Claire is a BBA 2018 graduate and an equity research associate at Fidelity. Claire, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little about yourself. Thanks, Graham, and hi, everyone. So my name is Claire, and I graduated from the BBA program in 2018. My career in finance started at Laurier through their co-op program, where I had the opportunity to work at Gluskin Chef and at Fidelity Investments during my co-op placements. For the past two years since graduating, I've been working full time at Fidelity, where I mainly focus on investment opportunities in the utilities and consumer sectors. Thanks, Claire. Uh, to kick things off, I'll ask the first couple questions and I'll be monitoring the chat, which I can see is already quite active uh, with questions. If you have any specific questions for any of our speakers, please do not hesitate to write in. Uh, to get things started, Claire, what drew you to finance and did you start first year knowing that's what you wanted to study? Good question. So when I look back at where I was going into first year, I definitely didn't foresee a career in finance. Um, when I was going into my first year at Laurier, I had a summer job working full time at a turkey processing plant. And although that wasn't a great summer, I think that gave me a very clear idea of what I didn't want in a full time career. Uh, so going into Laurier, that gave me the idea that I wanted a career where I'd always be learning new things, um, where I was working with other people who were very ambitious and curious about the world. Um, and that was something that I found interesting and rewarding to do full time. Uh, so as I went to Laurier and started to learn more about different career paths in my first and second year, that's where a career in financing and investing seemed like it'd be a good fit based on those interests that I'd learned about. Interesting. So you didn't know exactly, but you know, going through the different courses, you're able to figure it out. Uh, Guavier, same question to you. Did you start out and first or know you were going to be in finance? Uh, a little bit different. I think more so than maybe Claire. Um, I enjoyed a stock competition in high school and really fell in love with that type of world. Didn't know what it all encompassed until I came to Laurier and, and worked in it, but Love the competition, the the research part of it. So kind of had an inkling that I kind of wanted to do something in that world. Um, and so as as time went on, I learned a little bit about it, and I learned about other career paths. I kind of solidified that I did want to do it. Um, and so that's how I kind of ended up in, in this career. Interesting. So the research aspect was was a bit of the the thing that kind of pulled you into it. Interesting. Uh, Faye, mm -hmm. same question. Did you start knowing that you would end up in finance? No, I, I actually ended up in business right from the get-go, knowing what I didn't want to do, which was I didn't want to go into science. So I, I thought, this, this kind of sounds interesting, and the, the, the kids on the brochure looked really nice and uh, looked like a, a fun place to be. They were all smiling. So uh, I think the thing for the, the Laurier program that I enjoyed the, the most or was the most attractive was the fact that you didn't have to specialize right away. So 
for me, I thought it was great that you had your first and second year to really get a full gamut. Um, I was in the co-op program and ended up, you know, with uh, articling, articling with uh, accounting firms. So that sort of took me on that path. But that being said, uh, you know, the ability to, you know, look at operations and HR, finance and sales and marketing, you know, it really gave you the full gamut to try and make the choice. Um, and then the co-op certainly helped to give you the, the practical hands-on experience. Yes. No, I didn't know. I had no idea. That's. It's interesting that you knew exactly what you didn't want to do, and then yeah, <laughs> it's kind of presented themselves to you. Uh, and Mike, how about you? Did you know when you started in first year that you know finance was the vertical you wanted to focus in on, and and really spend your time studying? So, I mean, the truth is, I was never a first year at Laurier. Um, I actually am from BC originally, and I started off at. I was, I'm from a small town in BC, and I started off my post-secondary at a local community college. So my first year there, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I was thinking about accounting. And what happened, what led to my interest is basically, um, I had a scholarship to go to this college, so I didn't have tuition to pay. I was living at home, so all the money I'd saved up, um, I had available. And I knew at that point, my limit of finance knowledge was that a stock market existed and that you're supposed to put money into it. So I decided I wanted to do that and I knew I didn't know anything. So I thought I'd read a book. And again, the extent of my effort at that point was I asked my mom, do we have a book on investing? And she said, I think there's one in the basement. So I went into our basement. I found a really dusty copy of One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch, which was very lucky because it's a really great intro book for anyone who wants to learn about investing. It's relatively short, it's very entertaining, and the investment philosophy uh, in it is, is actually pretty good. So I read that, I got very excited, and something kind of clicked. So I started reading more online about careers in finance and careers in investing specifically. And at a certain point, I felt like I had exhausted really what information was there that could tell me more about the careers, and I really wanted to get specifics. So I would start to go online and I would look at different investment firms and I would read their their uh, like people section. So first I'd read the philosophy section. If they sounded like they were a fit, I'd read about the people there and I would basically write down someone's name. And I started to uh, send out emails. And over the course of about three months, I sent around 250 emails out. And I actually had phone calls with 50 different uh, people, mostly portfolio managers. And those conversations convinced me that I was very interested in a career in investing and in finance, and that I needed to go to a better school that was also closer to Toronto. Um, and that led me to transfer to Laurier. So when I arrived at Laurier in second year, I was dead set on finance and investing at that point. You know, it, it's interesting your, your, your path there, but you know, focusing in on you know, the research and the reading you did, um, mm -hmm. you know, really solidified that's what you wanted to study. And I think for our students listening today, you know, be it, you know, finance, marketing, accounting, you know, do some reading about it. Talk to some people who are in these fields and get a better idea of, you know, what the jobs and opportunities are. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Ed, I, I have a question for you. And, you know, I know you didn't start your career in finance, but how did your time at the Lazaridi School prepare you for your first job at, at Arthur Anderson in consulting? And, um, how has how has that helped you, you know, through the rest of your career in finance? Um, yeah, no, I, um, you know, I think uh, with a lot of people on the call, you know, sometimes you find out what you're good at. Actually, just a couple of lessons I've learned along the way. One is just because you're good at something doesn't mean you should do it. And that was kind of my consulting career. So, you know, I could do it, but I didn't really like it. Um, and then, um, you know, I think the thing about, uh, and I think I should have gotten into finance right out of, out of Laurier. You know, I think, you know, Laurier, I think it was a very rigorous program. And, um, uh, you know, I, in some ways, I think I was probably technically stronger out of Laurier than I did coming out of my MBA. And, uh, you know, probably should have done it right away. But, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Laurier uh, prepared me well, both for Arthur and then, you know, working for Goldman and, and, and Marilyn Lehman and Pimco. And, um, yeah, I, I think uh, Laurier has a, just a rigorous program, and um, 
you know, I, that allowed me to compete at, you know, kind of the highest levels kind of internationally in the, in the markets. And I never once thought, boy, I wish I had learned X or Y. I thought the training was uh, first class. You know, you make a really good point that, you know, the, the classes that are going to be available in the, in the technology, be it the Bloomberg lab that's at the, on campus that, you know, coming out of your undergrad, you know, you are really set up for a, for a career in finance. And this actually loops back, uh, you know, to Claire and Mike. You both started your careers as co-ops at Gluskin, um, you know, working for you know another notable alumni, Bill Webb. Yeah. How did your time as a student prepare you for those you know first co-op roles? And you know, Claire, I'll, I'll start with you. I think one of the great things about the Laurier program was that it connected me to some of those opportunities. Um, especially as someone coming from a small town, I didn't really know people in finance or know how to break in the industry on my own. So I think that just having connections to those opportunities through the co-op job postings definitely accelerated my career just by providing me with access to really great opportunities to learn um, from a community of alumni members at Laurier who really wanted to see current students succeed. Interesting. Mike, any anything to add? How did your time at Laurier prepare you for those first couple of roles at Gluskin? I mean, uh, I'd, I'd say that it does come down to that there is a really good, specifically for investing, I guess, there is a really good kind of consistent group of people at Laurier. They always seem to exist. And there there's two main, I think, groups that um, help. So one is called the Laurier Student Investment Fund. Um, it's something that's available when you're typically in third or fourth year. And joining that uh, really connects you to, to some of the best people that you could know if you're interested in finance because it's all like-minded people who are typically very, uh, I don't know, hard-driving people that are going to kind of put you on the right path. But even before that, there are other clubs. And I know the first day I walked in, I think there was some kind of club type fair and there was a different investing fund that was student run. And I joined that immediately and talked to like-minded people. So being having access and being able to talk to people that are interested in the same thing and all working and pushing and learning about it was immediately very helpful. And I don't know, it kind of gives you a bit of a leg up, at least for anyone who's not doing that. It's interesting you mentioned the clubs and you know, there's over 30 of them in the business school alone. And um, you, know, you mentioned both the investment fund and we'll, we'll loop back to that a little bit later, but uh, thanks for that. Uh, Faye-Ann, what part of your career have you enjoyed the most thus far? You've done a couple different things. Is there anything that really stands out either from a from a work project perspective or on the people side? So I um I get quite involved with uh, M and A activity, and uh, I think for myself personally, the finance is is you know one stream, and I'm you know obviously you come out and you're very technical technically capable in that, but it's being able to um, bring all the facets of the business together and being a strong financial advisor. So in the M&A activity, you know, you're one work stream in a, in a project plan, but where you can actually help and provide support across um, all disciplines, that's the sort of thing that I love doing. So I love seeing the projects come through to completion. Um, I love it when, you know, two plus two equals five and we end up making a bigger and better business. And, um, and I think, really working with the other disciplines and, and really being almost a consultant every single day, even though I sit with one particular chair, one particular title, um, you know, it's, it's how you, you view that and what you take on um, in, your, in your own path and how you interact with everyone else in the business. So um, being an interactive, innovative CFO is certainly the part that um, I enjoy the most about my career. It's not just about closing the books for me. Um, and, you know, for some businesses, that's what they're looking for. But uh, where I've had the most fun and the most success is where, you know, you're a real valuable member of the executive team and you're, you're really helping to drive the business forward. So you mentioned, you know, being a consultant and being a, you know, a valued member of the executive team. Have you found, did that come easy to you or was that something that you, you had to learn and work on um, through your career? Well, I mean, I think it came relatively easy because the, the basis and genesis, genesis of the whole Laurier business program at the time was around teamwork and case studies and collaboration. 
And I mean, those are the pieces that, you know, I do every single day. You know, my, my children used to ask, mom, what do you do? And I would say, I help people solve problems because that's what I do. Now I'm, I'm kind of more the one who helps them solve all their math problems and some of their finance problems or figure out how we're gonna pay for something or how we're you know, gonna make the most money we possibly can. But you know, really we're just every day, that's what we're being asked to do is, is solve problems and, uh, and you can really only do that when you're part of a whole team. And so yeah, I think, you know, I, I found it came relatively easy to me, but I do think it's really because of the, the program that, uh, that Lori offered that I, it gave me certainly the confidence to be able to, uh, to do that. I, I think you make a great point about the teamwork. You know, it's something that these students are gonna have to do. And, um, you know, in the first year they'll be doing it remotely, but it's, it's that, you know, basic grounding and working with other people and you know, working on cases and solving problems. Uh, I actually think that would be really good training. I mean, I think the way we work is going to be much different going forward. So um, I think they're going to come out with a leg up, certainly, because they've uh, just started out working that way. Um, so I don't think there's there's any issue that that's going to pose for them long term. Um, I think it's probably going to be really good prep, uh, you know, good prep for you guys. <laughs> you can probably teach us a few things. Well, you know, it, it's it's interesting because I actually I have a question here in the chat already. Um, and you know, whoever wants to jump in on this one, you know, just you know, just put your hand up, start waving. But uh, uh, the question is, is we're all dealing in a unique situation brought on the pandemic. Um, how have you adjusted to working with team members remotely? And do you have any tips for students who'll be starting school remote in the fall? I can start, I guess. Um, I think patience is a, a you know a virtue that's going to really come into play. Um, communication is not as easy working as a team. Obviously, these are a lot more communications easier when you're sitting beside someone or questions can be asked quicker. So, you know, you're just going to have to get used to communicating um, more efficiently, more concisely and getting to a message across so that those are skills that you're going to have to get better at quickly. And I think this kind of leads it to that. Um, but I think patience is a big one. And, um, you know, it, it's just it's gonna you're gonna take more effort to work as a team just because you're doing it virtually rather than in person. Anything you've done that has made it easier? You know, any little hacks or tips? Um, I don't know if there's any hacks or tips. I think as time goes on, you just become better at it. You know, you organize your day differently or. You know, the big thing that you can get stuck on, especially today, is getting stuck on calls all day because one question that you would have had that would have taken two minutes with the team member, but you may now be on a call for 15 minutes. So getting better at, you know, only scheduling calls that are important and, and using email more efficiently and, and just organizing differently, right? There's just a very different information flow that's less efficient that now we're not in the same uh, place altogether. I think that's a great point, you know, being really protective of, you know, your time and being, you know, taking classes uh, remotely is you're going to be able to have to set aside time to just study and then set aside time to do group work because you know, I think we can all attest that, you know, meetings can crop in from anywhere. Uh, anyone want to expand or have any other ideas? Ed? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the one thing that I, you know, that um, for, for the young folks on the call is they're, there are things, I think one of the big lessons we're gonna take away from this uh, COVID situation is we're gonna to learn to do things better. Mm -hmm. And it's not just catch up, it's do better. And, you know, I, 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 we've done a few, um, you know, group, you know, uh, sessions, if you will. And what you end up finding is things like as simple as there's technology now that allows us to, if you were like, hey, we've got a uh, hundred dollars to invest and there's three opportunities, what do we do? And instead of like, a human dynamic when you're all in the room and people are shy and they're afraid to put their hand up or think they put their hand up, they have a stigma and it's not, you can, you know, virtually find out right away anonymously what people really think. And there's all these other things. So I think there's things that, you know, I would uh, think that the, the, the young folks on the call here are gonna, I would challenge you to think about not just keeping up, but how do you improve upon where we were before? Because there are some downsides, and you know, and, and and they're unfortunate. But my guess is there's going to be a lot of upsides. And those of you that are smart enough and innovative enough and energetic enough to 
figure out what the upside is, you know, those, uh, you know, to the victor go the spoils. So, you know, there'll, there'll be there'll be some great rewards for you, for you folks out there. So I wouldn't be completely, uh, you know, um, pessimistic about, um, you know, starting uh, the, your university career off this way. No, we've actually done a lot of fun things too. So we'll do virtual happy hours and, and you know, all kinds of things like that. So there's lots of ways that you can actually still get to know people and it doesn't have to be all work. You can put a little bit of play in there too. So you can be creative. I think those are some great points. Uh, and then thank you for the student who sent that question in. Uh, Guavier, question for you. What was your you know, favorite class or extracurricular activity while you were in school? It's a tough one. It's been a while, but uh, I would say- you were, in a couple, you, you were involved in a couple clubs, right? Yeah, um, I think from like a finance perspective, like uh, as as Mike mentioned earlier, the the student investment fund was obviously a highlight. Um, I did that for two years. It was a PM in my last year. You know that that was a great time. You know, you do meet a lot of good people and you create a network through that. And it was a lot of good learning. And it was it was uh, you know both both professors who run that program are, are very smart and you know you get a lot of knowledge from them. So that was obviously a great opportunity. From classes, I think for me was is later on in third and fourth year as you specialize and you kind of got into the nitty gritty of of understanding you know the nuances of a lot of the finance area. That's the, those are the classes that I like the most. Um, and you know you kind of figured out what you wanted to do and what you didn't want to do after you've gotten the basis after the first two years. So I enjoyed that. And for more extracurricular, obviously in the third and fourth year. When I hope everyone is back on campus, you know, MLSB is a great time. Um, you know, people talk about going to school in the summer and how that's terrible. I would say it was probably my favorite summers was going being at Laurier in the summer for those two years. Um, so I think those are, you know, things that everyone here hopefully has to look forward to um, as you get into third and fourth year. Thanks for that. Uh, Claire, same question. You were involved as a student. What uh, what were some highlights, you know, or what was a favorite class? Sure. So as mentioned by some of the other panelists, I was also a member of the Student Investment Fund during my time on campus, and that was a great way to gain practical experience before starting a career in finance. Um, outside of some of my classes and more academic-oriented clubs, I was also involved as a varsity athlete on the cross-country and track teams. Uh, throughout second to fourth year at Laurier, and I found that was a really great experience for me. Um, I think just having that foundation of practices and a group of teammates that you got along really well with, um, and the experience of going to meets um, throughout my time at university as well, um, was a very uh, positive aspect of my university experience at Laurier. Did you find it difficult managing classwork and being an athlete, or and and how did you manage that? It, there was definitely a lot of conflicts, um, but I think that was great preparation for my career in terms of just getting used to being able to manage sometimes conflicting priorities, um, a lot of different scheduled meetings or practices, um, and trying to balance those. I think it was very good for me getting experience in terms of just prioritizing what was important to me uh, throughout my time at school and now continuing to run um, while working full time. That's amazing. One, you know, one more follow-up I have for you. You were part of the Laurier Startup Fund. Could you talk a little bit about that? You know, for our students on the call, so they, you know, I, I think the you know investment fund, you know, they know a little bit about, but just expand on the startup fund. Sure. So the startup fund um, is another way for students to gain experience in investing during their time at Laurier. There are some prerequisite finance courses for participating in the startup fund. So usually it's open to fourth year students at Laurier or fifth year students in a double degree program. It's overseen by one of the finance professors, Brian Smith, who's also involved with the student investment fund at Laurier. Uh, so he's a great mentor for students who are interested in finance. And how the startup fund is structured is you'll be doing due diligence on a potential investment in a private company. Um, usually you'll work with a partner on this assignment and you'll be interacting with the management team of the company, uh, doing your own industry and company analysis and financial projections and deciding whether we, or not we should invest in that private company. Uh, so a lot of the framework is um, similar to the type of due diligence that you would do 
within the student investment fund, but instead of uh, doing due diligence on a publicly listed company, you're working more with earlier stage private companies. Interesting. And you found that to be exciting, interesting? It was interesting. I think it was another great way just to gain more experience in investing during my time at Laurier. Uh, and it also counted as a course, which was uh, great to find courses that were aligned with what I was interested in doing full time as I progressed more to my third and fourth years at Laurier. No, it sounds great. Um, Mike, same type of question. I know you were part of the investment fund as well, but was there a specific course or another extracurricular, extracurricular activity that really uh, you took some value from being a, a student on campus? Uh, yeah, so I mean, MLSB and LSIP were mentioned, so I'll leave those alone, but I would like to reiterate how important those are. Um, two other things stand out. So from the course side, I may get the name wrong. Uh, I think it was called Advanced Corporate Finance which doesn't sound great, but it was really the professor. I, there's gonna be a lot of good courses, but some of the professors you're gonna find are gonna be what really make them excellent. This course was taught by a professor called Andre Shakilko. And so I'm just gonna say it again carefully so you recognize it when you hear it in the future. Andre Shakilko. If you can ever take a course with him, I don't care what he winds up teaching, I would highly recommend it. This course in particular, what, whatever spectrum you're on from highly interested in finance to just barely and you took it because your friend did, everyone left that. Everyone wanted to be in that class every day and every word that professor said was just incredible. He's a great presenter, a great teacher, and we learned a lot. So advanced corporate finance, Andre Shakilko, anything he teaches I would attend. Um, and then from the extracurricular side, there was uh, there's a lot of extracurriculars. The other one I did, was called JDC, and it's essentially a case competition uh, type club where you're either on a marketing group, a finance group, any academic gr area, there's a group of three, you learn how to do cases really well and present them, uh, and in a three hour period, you basically do a case, make a full presentation, and then do a 20 minute presentation right afterward. Um, that may or may not sound fun at this point, but it was a great experience. You learn a lot, you bond with a lot of great uh, people that you're going to meet on that club, and then the actual event is fun. And there's a lot of different, I think there's a lot more different case programs that Laurier has now, so I would look out for those. Uh, there's a couple other case programs, but, you know, Andre is a great professor, and I, I echo your statement, you know, if the students can get into one of his courses, you know, absolutely should. Um, I'm seeing another question here from a student. It's directed at Ed. Um, Student is wondering, Ed, if mentors have played a role into getting where you are now, and if so, how did you develop those relationships? Absolutely, 100%. So I don't think anyone gets ahead in life without mentors, uh, whether they start with your parents and then go on to your professional life, uh, for sure. Um, and, and, I, and I never really had a scientific approach to that, so I, I, I don't know if I'm going to give good advice here, but um, you know, I think often, you know, mentors are people you just click with, you know, people who, you know, I think you maybe share values with, you know, you know, hopefully, you know, my biggest tip would be, you know, work hard, keep your head down, be honest and be helpful, you know, are probably the things to do. And often if you're fortunate, like I was, um, I work with some of the, uh, you know, again, I work with some of the greatest investors in the world, legendary investors. Um, who I got to learn from and which was just awesome. Um, so I think that mentorship is incredibly important. Um, I don't know how to you know, be a good mentee because I don't know how it happened. I got lucky, I think. I think it was gonna, sometimes, you know, they often say in the markets, it's better to be lucky than good. And I believe that's true, I was just lucky. Um, but um, yes, mentorship is really important. Um, I don't know, maybe I'd, I'd pass this up to some of my other panelists who might have better, uh, um, you know, recommendations, but, you know, I think that, uh, you know, uh, when you, I find mentorship is the one, here's the one thing I'll give you as a tip, it's it's a two-way contract. It's they, you know, impose, or not impose, they, they provide you with knowledge and wisdom, and you do your best to try to make them look good and um, and thank them. And I think that's the best way to do it. Interesting point. Anyone have anything to add? Anyone have any experience uh, 
with a mentor or um, finding one? I can speak a bit to my experience with having mentors in the industry. I think throughout my career, I've had both informal and formal mentors. With informal mentors, I think those relationships were kind of like what Ed mentioned. They form more um, just naturally with people that you worked with especially in some of my earlier co-op placements when I was still learning a lot about the industry. And I found that they were just generally people who I got along well with. Uh, they were willing to offer a lot of their time uh, to help me improve and answer my questions and give me honest feedback on the work I was doing. Um, and I think that those people um, weren't formal mentors, but had a very big impact on my ability to land my full-time job and succeed in the earlier stages of my career. Uh, so I think that's important when you're looking at some of your first co-op or internship positions. Sort of, are these people who are willing to help me succeed and learn more about the industry? I've also uh, opted to participate in some more formal mentorship programs. Like, for example, Women in Capital Markets is an organization um, that has some formal mentorships for both university students and people in the earlier stage of, this, of their careers. Uh, and I found that just by participating in that program, that was a good way to meet people who were working outside of my firm, uh, had different experiences and perspectives, and that I might not meet in my day-to-day -day, um, job. So I think there's a lot of opportunities both to meet informal mentors just in the, at the places that you're working at, uh, as well as some formal mentorship programs available in the industry. I think it's a great tip about the women in capital markets and you know there's there's groups and clubs like that for you know almost every type of industry so you know, be it that you end up in a marketing role, you know, look and find um, going concerns where you can connect and um, with people who are in your industry a couple years along. Uh, Mike, just a follow up from your one of your earlier questions, those 250 emails and 50, you know, calls you ended up having, did you stay in touch with any of those people? I, I did. Uh, it was funny. The, the very first batch of eight emails I sent um, I hadn't even written like questions yet that I was going to kind of have for everyone, but I sent my first batch of emails and within, I think, 30 minutes, my cell phone rang and I had my phone number in my email and I didn't recognize the area code. And, and anyway, I picked up and it was a portfolio manager from a firm called Mower Investment Management in Alberta. And uh, it was essentially, that was like my dream. Like if I pictured how I wanted these emails to be replied to and the calls that I was going to have, this was the ideal one where the person opened the floor, let me ask all the questions I wanted, gave thoughtful and helpful replies. Then they paused, they turned the call back on me and they said, uh, Mike, I, I want to know a bit more about you. And they asked me questions for about 20 minutes. And then at the end of the call, they said, you know, I'd like to keep in touch. I'd like you to follow. They actually just turned it basically into a formal thing. They said, I'd like to keep in touch and see your development. So every six months, I'd like you to call me. I'd like you to tell me everything you've been re reading. I'd like to know how your investment philosophy is shaping up. And we'll just go from there. And then I didn't even wait six months. He actually followed up with me in about two months and said, if you'd like, I kind of, I have a project for you. If you'd like, you could look at this company we give you. Um, first, read these two books, then look at this company. Uh, answer these questions about it. And if you do this, we will sit down and have a call and me and my colleagues will all ask you questions about the company. And so I did that and I remained in touch with them for, for many years. And so that's, that's maybe the best case and I wouldn't expect that to happen. But uh, there were other people who I spoke to who really all my networking was, was trying to hear the person's story. Like how did they get into finance? Where did their interests come from? What was their path? What advice do they have, if any? And people that you click with will naturally extend to you or often have to extend to you just the invitation to keep in touch with them. And if you like them too, you'll follow up and create basically a mentor-mentee relationship. That first one was just a really crazy one-off that turned out to be very helpful. I think, it, I think it highlights that if you don't ask, you know, you're never going to get anything. And, you know, for everyone listening today, our students, you know, there is a massive alumni network that you're you know now a part of as a, as a student at the Lazaridi school and uh, you know my experience has always been you know reaching out to alumni they're always interested to chat and and, and share advice so um, there are you know a ton of clubs on campus that interact with alumni all the time and you know, they host networking events and it's a great place to start you know building some of those relationships of your own before you start working uh, 
Yeah, Graham, just on that, uh, the, the one thing yeah. I would just add was it's great to reach out to alumni and something you should do, but the things that alumni, as Ed said, it's a two-way street. So show that you're passionate, show that you've done your research, and show that you're really interested in it. Um, that's what's really going to make a men mentor really come to it and feel involved because they're going to want to put work into it because you put work into it. So I think that's a very important thing is once you're going to go email, be very systematic about why you're emailing them. This is what I've done. This is the work I have done. And I thought you were a good, re really good person to reach out to to learn more. I just want to say yes, like very much that. It's so important. People that people get a lot of emails and they're selective about who they reply to. So you, you need to demonstrate something in that email and keep it concise as well. I think those are great points. Uh, you know, I think a nice little transition, Guavier, uh, what skills do you think are important for someone looking at a career in finance? I, I think it, it really depends on where you want to take that finance. You know, we talk about finance as it's one thing, but it's a very broad range of different career options. For, for my career and looking at investments and, and focusing on that, I think, you know, there's hard skills and, and soft skills. So the hard skills, you know, you're still going to need to be somewhat quantitative oriented, um, you're going to need to be detail oriented. You're going to want to be inquisitive and you really have to have a passion for it. And when it comes to an investing world, you know, the way that you you do better than the next person is putting an extra effort and going on, you know, beyond what what everyone would do. So you really have to be passionate about it and you really need to be detail oriented. So those are, I think, skill sets that are a little bit more soft, but something that you build on as you go through your time at Laurier and you go through your classes, you're going to figure out that the more detail oriented you are, the more questions that you ask, the better that you're going to do. And that's going to go on with you in your career as well. So be very inquisitive. Good point. Faye Ann, same question. Uh, what skills do you think are important for someone who's going to pursue a career in finance? Yeah, so I have a lot of people and, um, you know, technical ability is core table stakes. So, you know, I feel like it's it's how you differentiate yourself after that is really kind of what, what it takes. The one thing that regardless of the discipline that you're in, in the finance general broad, is most people put in a lot of long hours at certain times and they're stressful times. So I think, you know, being able to demonstrate, whether it's through examples or through, um, you know, clubs you participate in, et cetera, where you can show that you've been a team player, you're someone who's willing to step up, um, that you like to have fun so that you can at least, when you're still slogging it out at whatever time of night or on the weekends, that you're still, you know, you've got a positive energy, positive personality. I mean, those are the things that I think, and to your point, uh, you know, it's a lot of softer skills. But those are the things that help differentiate and really want someone to have you be part of their team and be successful. Interesting. Good point on the soft skills. You know, it's not all, um, you know, quantitative, right? Sometimes there is that qualitative element. Uh, there's a question here from a student, to Ed, very specific. Um, what resources would you recommend for someone looking at investment banking as a career? Sorry, what resources? Yeah, I, I think they're specifically probably asking um, anything they should read, anything they should look to learn, um, anything specific they should do if they're looking just strictly at investment banking. So, um, so good question. I'm not sure I can answer it well, but I'll try. Um, I think there's the thing about investment banking is a, it's a bunch of different things. So just like um, one of the panelists said earlier, you know, finance sounds monolithic, but it's actually got a lot of different things. And there's, and if you think about it, there's, and uh, as Fian said, that you know, the skill set depending on what you're doing can be very, very different. I think finance in general has a kind of baseline. You need some technical skills, and some people excel at that, but you may or may not have that be your differentiator. But you know, if you look at investment banking, you've got um, sales and trading, so that's the buying and selling of securities. And there's generally two big divisions that do that, the equities division, the stocks that you know you buy and sell, and bonds, which I do, which you can buy and sell. And then you've got your advisory work, which are your investment bankers that you know originate the new bonds or the new stocks, or uh, as Fiam was talking about, a little bit of mergers and acquisitions where one company buys another company. So all of them are very, very different. And so you know it's hard for me to say, if you want to do this, do that. I'll tell you my favorite book. And just for fun, it's called Liar's Poker. 
And Liar's Poker was written about a, a legendary firm, a bunch of my friends worked there, um, called Solomon Brothers. It, it existed in the, you know, before the, and they went, they went away in the 90s. It's now part of Citigroup. And it's just a funny story about trading floors. And I'll tell you, though, you know, you're asking a little bit about Laurier and, you know, the different skill sets you have. And there's interpersonal skill sets and there's technical skill sets and all these various things. One thing I think, you know, taught me more about, not more about, but this shockingly actually relevant in my career was sitting up all night playing cards at Laurier. And, you know, just in a very quick way, we used to play a game called Hearts. And I won't bore people with the detail, but the ability to quickly compute probabilities and and make a decision based on a probability was actually something turned out to be helpful so i'm not going to try to make people delinquents but you know it doesn't all have to be books interesting yeah the street smarts do uh run in with the book smarts um, liars poker that was written by michael lewis correct that's michael lewis of uh moneyball fame and he's written a lot of really good books so the late the latest one is a good one called the fifth risk so I actually met, he's a friend, he's, a, I've worked with some legendary guys. He was in the Solomon Brothers training class with my friend and my, one of my mentors. So, you know, another book for these students to look at um, is Flash Boys. And Flash Boys was written by Michael Lewis and actually yep. features uh, one of our alumni, uh, Brad Katsuyama, uh, who ended up um, finding a way to, you know, beat the high frequency traders. So uh, and something else to look over over the next couple months before you uh, start classes. Um, you know, Claire, question for you, what advice do you have for students in terms of, you know, the mindset needed to position oneself to uh, succeed in finance? I guess in terms of mindset or some of the more qualitative traits that I think are important for people starting careers in finance, um, I think you need to be able to think independently. It's a career where you're often forced to develop your own opinion on certain topics or events. Um, and sometimes those ideas will be unpopular. Uh, so it's important that you're comfortable with coming up with your own ideas and executing on them. I think it's important to have intellectual honesty. So being willing to change your mind and communicate that to other people, even if things aren't going well, uh, especially in an industry where you're responsible for managing other people's money. Um, it's really important that you're always being honest about your views and willing to admit when you're wrong um, to help preserve the capital that they're trusting you with. Um, and I think it's important in your mindset that you have the ability to improve over time. I think everyone recognizes that when you're a student and in the early stages of your career, uh, you aren't gonna know everything on day one, but are you someone with a really strong work ethic and willing to ask questions or ask for help when you need it? I think if you're someone who demonstrates that you can get better at things over time, um, that's a really important skill to demonstrate in this industry. Um, so I think those three things, um, being able to think independently, be intellectual honest, um, and improve over time are things that everyone can focus on and um, has the ability to control, and I think are really important for success in this industry. I think those are three. Uh, Mike, any, any thoughts on characteristics or mindset that you know will help a, a young person succeed in finance uh i mean i keep i know it's finance i keep shortening it to investing because that's really the only place i probably have anything i can contribute um so if i can just do that again and i acknowledge that it won't be helpful uh to maybe the other areas but um i would say one unique thing at least with if you're someone who is focused on investing you can actually figure out if it's right for you before you ever get hired to do a co-op because you can actually do everything at home. Like you don't need anything special. You have an internet connection and Excel if you're, and that's all you need. So if that's a route you're interested in, I would say uh, at some point when you feel ready after you've read a few books or something, do take the time to pick a company and attempt to learn about it, value it, and write that into a report. And at the very least, that'll be a good exercise and you'll learn something. But if you enjoy that exercise, that's what what a lot of us are doing every day. And if you don't, then you'll know to spend your time elsewhere. So um, that's fortunate because you can't really practice, you know, an M&A transaction at home, but you can do this. 
So, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you can. Um, so I just point that out. And then the last thing I'd say, uh, and this maybe is more general, is just uh, the technical stuff and the, and the reading and learning and knowing certain things, that is, as was already said, table stakes, do all that, but also don't forget always to be a whole person. I mean, sometimes I've met people who have who absorbed the first piece so well, they know everything inside and out, and they've become a personified finance textbook. And while that's very impressive, the person that gets hired is like that, that remains personable, has a good attitude, and, and, and those soft elements become incredibly important in differentiating. So, you know, be someone other people want to be around. Yeah. Uh, one last, I uh, have one quick question um, from the from the question board, and anyone can jump in who's got uh, insight on this one. But uh, what resources would you recommend uh, that are online for students looking to pursue investing or finance? Any, I think this question is probably around reading. We've been talking a lot about books. Is there anything specifically online that you'd recommend or suggest they start subscribing to, be it newsletters or quarterly reports? Ed. Eric, an easy one for you guys. Look up Elm Partners, E-L-M, just Elm Partners, and it's by a guy named Victor Hagani, who was one of the guys from Solomon Brothers, who they had a, they actually spectacularly blew up, actually created a little bit of a ruckus around the world in the late 90s. But he actually got himself paid about $500 million a year for a couple of years, and then realized afterwards he knew nothing about investing and spent decades the last couple, he's a very bright guy, and he's got a really interesting perspective and spent 10 minutes on his TED talk. And I think you would find it, and it goes to show about how, back to uh, one of the previous panelists who said, you can be technically good, but not really get the bigger picture. And I think when you look at, you know, questioning everything, and, he, and, and after you know, a long career, he questioned everything. I think that's kind of a fun thing for people to watch. So if you're, if you're interested in like a holistic view of investing, look at Elm Partners. His name is Victor Hagani. Good tip. Gravier? Um, A couple of things. One advice that I got really early in my career is just read the newspaper. I know it's all online now through the library or whatever. Just read the FT on a daily basis. Read the Wall Street Journal. That You will pick up a lot more than you think just reading through the articles and you'll just build a lot of knowledge. Uh, just doing that. Uh, the two, you know, the couple of internet um, resources, one would be Aswath Duramadan, which is the NYU Stern professor. He puts a lot of stuff on his website. He's known as almost a guru of um, valuations. So if you really want to get into understanding valuations a lot more, um, that is a, a good resource of somebody who's very textbook based just to get, get the fundament, uh, fundamental skills. Perfect. If uh, if no one else has anything else for that question, oh, Mike, yep. I'll just I'll just toss on a, a quick couple of books and leave it at that. But uh, if you're whether it's business or investing, if you're up for it, reading Warren Buffett's letters to shareholders, particularly the older ones, those are very educational on a number of fronts and relatively entertaining. You don't have to read the entire letter, just the part where he's talking in normal words. Once he gets into the actual numbers and the like annual report information, you can you can move on. Uh, if you're interested in investing specifically, Expectations Investing by Michael Mobison, or really anything by Michael Mobison, but Expectations Investing would be a great uh, kind of intro book that covers how to analyze a company and think about investing. And then lastly, and this is a little beefier, so you probably can dodge it, but Valuation by McKinsey is a bit of a tome. It's very famous. Uh, it would be foundational for both investing and finance, and you don't have to read it in one shot. You could read, I think, the first part of the book. It's in a number of pieces, but even some of the early stuff is very, very helpful uh, when when you're trying to think about un how to understand companies and do analysis. So even this is the beginning of that, and you can save the rest for later. Uh, I think all that's great. I think these students are going to be busy right up until they start in September. Just looking at the clock, I'm noticing we're almost out of time, and so I'll ask everyone one last question. It'll be the same question, and I'll I'll start with you, Claire. If you could go back and give yourself advice before you started university, what would it be? It's been suggested by some of the other panelists throughout some of the questions, but I think it's really important to ask for help when you need it. 
I think that was something that was maybe a bit difficult at the very start of university because I was used to high school where usually I could figure out courses or other tasks by myself. Um, but I think in university, just given that you'll be entering a lot of new situations, it can help you out a lot uh, with your career and your classes if you're willing to ask for help early on when you need it. To supplement that, there is you know so much help that's available through you know, be it the writing center, be it accessible learning if you need help with note takers, um, TAs will help you, there's supplemental instruction. So, you know, don't ever feel like you're alone when you start doing courses and you get stumped. You know, there's lots of things um, that are there for you to uh, help you succeed. Uh, Gorbier, what would you tell yourself starting first year, uh, if you could? Um, I, I, would, I, I would tell myself, take a step back You'll figure out your career and what you want to do throughout the four years. Enjoy your time at Laurier. Enjoy, um, you know, these four years because you know we all probably miss being in that those four years back uh, back at school. So I think just enjoy yourself and and you'll figure out over the time and the four years of what you're good at and what you want to do. You don't have to rush that decision, um, and you'll have a lot of time to kind of figure that out. I think that's great advice, you know, slow down, you know, four years will go by very quickly. Um, Faye Ann, what would you tell yourself entering first year? Yeah, I think it's to to probably build a little bit off of that. Um, I think when you come in, you're just so excited and you're so keen and you just focus so much on the schoolwork. Um, you know, I think it is important to 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 be reflective enjoy it take time put yourself out there get involved um, sometimes things seem like scary time commitments and you're not quite sure how to manage and, and balance your days but you will find ways to get everything done um, so i would say you know put yourself out there learn as much as you can and meet as many people as possible because you know the one thing i've reflected on now after you know the many years i've been away from school is how many people you run into whether it's downtown Toronto on the GO train or when I'm traveling in London, England, you run into people all the time. And the bigger your network is these days, the better that better than ever. So uh, so those would be some of my thoughts. That's great advice. Mike, what would you tell yourself starting first year? Well, um, I mean, go to, you're going go to go to Laurier class. originally, right? Yeah, yeah at Laurier. So. I would say, look, you're, you're going to go to classes, you're going to party and have fun, you're going to do all those things regardless. I would say one thing that you'll hear people be told to do that's almost a cliche is to get involved and join clubs or student organizations and things like that. And although it's a cliche, what you never hear people say is, you never hear people say, I deeply regret joining that, that club or that finance thing or that marketing or whatever it is you ended up doing, that case club. You never hear them say they deeply regretted that, and that's because it's a cliche to join these things for a reason. It's going to enrich your experience, teach you something, connect you to people, and so it's a good sign that it's a no-brainer to do that. Uh, and so I would say do that. Like it's you're going to benefit in a number of ways, and you're not going to regret it because you'd be the first. You know, hundred percent on that. The the people I hear do it the other way, right? They regret not being more involved. So you know, there's lots of opportunities coming your way and you know, try things out. If it doesn't work, you try another thing. So thanks, Mike. Uh, last word to you, Ed. What would you tell us? <laughs> no pressure? <laughs> yeah, no pressure entering uh, you know, first year. Yeah, so which was, uh, is that 37 years ago? It could be. So as, um, you know, I think there's, uh, by the way, oh, almost universally agree with everything the other panelists said. Um, so if I was to synthesize it down, it's basically two things. I've got lifelong friends that I still stay in touch with around the world. You'll learn more from your, your classmates almost than you will from your professors. So, you know, learn from your classmates, enjoy your time there. In addition to, in addition to playing cards, never mind. And the other thing I think that distinguishes Laurier is, you know, as opposed to some fantastic schools, U of T, others that are great uni uh, research universities, Laurier is a teaching university. And, and unfortunately, I'm so old because I graduated 32 years ago, but I don't remember any of the professors that we're talking about today. 
but like one of them, I had some great mentors and uh, professors. I, I remember Dr. DeGore was um, the head of uh, Pete Marwick, an old account, account consulting firm here in Canada. But he was in the Battle of Britain. He was an old Welshman. He crashed his plane three times behind enemy lines in World War II. And that guy taught me more things and I learned more from him life lessons at Laurier. So get to know your professors. You know, the thing about Laurier is it's much smaller than a lot of the other schools. The professors are really keen to impart their knowledge. There's some terrific professors. I hope they're still terrific professors. I'm, I'm a little old. Uh, I'm sure the new, newer alums told me that. And like, you know, learn from your, cl your classmates but and, and learn from your professors because they're there to help you. And if you do that, you'll get a lot of Laurier. Uh, you're right. You know, we have exceptional professor, prof uh, professors and you know they have office hours you know they're involved in the clubs and you know do get to know them because they can help you a lot uh ed fayan guavier mike and claire on behalf of everyone today i'd like to thank you for sharing your insights and experience with us you not know, every day students have the opportunity to hear directly from you know leading alumnus in investment and in, in finance uh, don't forget to follow the lazaridi school on our social accounts to stay up to date on important information uh, thank you again uh, for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.